Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Schutz coming to you live from my home. On the show tonight. Clear the chamber now. An alder person collapses at city council's last meeting of the year. Details on that and much more. Sometimes there's uh, too much attention paid to the gamesmanship. After a rough day in City Hall, the mayor waxes philosophical. We'll talk about that and much more in Spotlight Politics. We can say that optimal protection when you're dealing with an mRNA is with three doses. Omicron is here in Illinois and it's expected to spread rapidly, but will it cause severe symptoms? Doctors weigh in on the latest. A new investigation into the demolition of Cabrini Green reveals a history of broken promises. A new effort from Chicago's Public Health Department could reduce the number of opioid-related overdoses. A Chicago-based photographer focuses on immigrants who own and operate small businesses. And how a community campaign in Inglewood is encouraging folks to get the COVID vaccine. And of course, Paris will check back in with you a little bit later on in the show. But first, some of today's top stories. Indicted 34th Ward Alderperson Carrie Austin collapses during today's city council meeting. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We have a medical emergency. Clear the chamber. 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 Now. Tense moments there. Austin was treated by former firefighter alderperson Anthony Napolitano before reviving and being taken out of council chambers on a stretcher. Alderperson Emma Mitz says Austin had experienced pain on the side of her body but was conscious and resisted being taken to the hospital for an examination. After the meeting, Mayor Lori Lightfoot declined to provide an update on Austin's condition but says that she is praying for the 72-year-old. We'll have much more on today's council meeting coming up. The Omicron variant of COVID-19 has been detected in suburban Cook County. County public health officials made the announcement this morning. Yesterday, we had confirmation of our first Omicron uh, case diagnosed um, in a resident in suburban Cook County. And in addition, there are several other individuals that are waiting uh, genotyping to confirm or not whether they also have Omicron. Uh, due to their uh, exposure or travel history. Rubin says vaccinations and booster shots are vital. She urges all unvaccinated residents to not attend any holiday celebrations or social events during this time. And we'll have more on the spread of the highly contagious Omicron variant later in the program. The long running saga of the sale of the Thompson Center may be over. Governor J.B. Pritzker says the state has finally found a potential buyer. For two decades, Illinois governors have known that the sale of the James R. Thompson Center was essential to achieving efficiency in our state government operations. Today, I am proud to announce that for the very first time, we're taking a massive step forward with a plan that will result in the sale of the Thompson Center and that will save taxpayers $800 million. Pritzker says following a request for proposals, the state is in exclusive negotiations with JRTC Holdings to buy and redevelop the site at 100 West Randolph Street. The price tag, an upfront payment of $70 million. Pritzker says the state can no longer afford the building's, quote, unsustainable costs. The developer plans a mixed-use space with the state retaining a roughly 30% ownership stake in the Helmet Yawn designed building. Up next, details on a wild day at City Council. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Residents in one north side neighborhood are getting more affordable housing. City council members agree on a multi-million dollar settlement for Anjanette Young. And sports betting in Chicago arenas is on. All of this as one alderman collapses during the meeting. But if there was one Christmas miracle today, city council took care of all of the pressing business on its agenda, making today's meeting the last one of the year for alder people. 
as well as for our WTTW news reporter Heather Sharon to cover. She joins us now with more. Heather, so a big moment of contention today, that proposal for an affordable housing complex complex it passed defying the wishes of 44 44 first i can talk 41st word alter person uh anthony napolitano take a listen to what he said before the measure passed i'm in the hot seat right now you're going to be in this hot seat tomorrow and when it goes around your ward your zoning committees like i have one when it goes around them and it goes around you to decide whether this is best for your ward and it goes straight to city hall and then right to zoning and you vote no and everyone else votes yes because they're told to, you're going to be in the same exact predicament I'm in right now. It is now a precedent being set. So Heather, what is that precedent? Why is he warning his colleagues? Well, that 33 to 13 city council vote represents a nearly unprecedented rebuke of the decades old tradition of giving older people the final say over housing developments in that in their ward. Now, that practice has been harshly criticized as fueling systematic racism and segregation in Chicago. And Mayor Lori Lightfoot acknowledged after the meeting the significance of the vote, and she said that that was potentially a good one, especially if it sets the precedent that affordable housing, and there are 59 affordable housing units in this development, belong in every neighborhood in Chicago, especially one of Chicago's wealthiest neighborhoods right on the border with Park Ridge and near O'Hare. Now, two other actions today. There's that settlement, of course, for Anjanette Young, as well as a decision on sports betting. Uh, tell us about both of those, please. Well, the lawsuit filed by Anjanette Young after she, her house was raided in February 19, February 2019, uh, will be resolved with a payment of $2.9 million. And of course, we all saw that horrific video of Anjanette Young left naked, handcuffed, and pleading for help. However, there are no more changes in the hopper for the city's search warrant policies. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says that the needed changes after that incident have been made. Also, uh, you can place a bet on your way back from the hot dog stand at Chicago's sports stadiums in the coming months. Uh, that allowing the sports betting will, will go forward. And uh, Chicago sports teams owners are no doubt thrilled about that. They lobbied the city council very hard. Okay, so before we let you go, Heather, of course, we uh, mentioned earlier Alderman uh, Kerry Austin collapsing during today's meeting. You were there in the chamber when it happened. Uh, do we, what do we know about her condition and what was it like in those moments? Well, we don't have an update on her conditions, unfortunately, on her condition, unfortunately. We do know, as you said at the top of the show, that she was conscious and talking to her colleagues after the incident. Uh, the city council was in the middle of its work, and I saw her just sort of slump over, prompting her colleagues to respond with alarm and to get her help. Um, we understand from Alderman Ebba Mitz that Alderman Anthony Napolitano, a former firefighter, checked her vital signs and sort of made sure that she was comfortable in the moments before the paramedics arrived. She has a long history of illnesses, including cardiac problems, and she recovered from COVID-19 back in 2020. Okay, Heather, uh, thank you so much. And of course, we'll see you a bit later in the program with the rest of our Spotlight Politics team. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Heather's stories from today's city council meeting on our website. They're all at WTTW.com news. And now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. A study out of South Africa shows that the Omicron variant is infectious, but less severe. Now, this study is based on preliminary data, and it shows that two doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine provide 70% efficacy against serious illness and hospitalization. Now, this is the second reported case of the variant in Illinois is causing concern among infectious disease specialists. And joining us to talk about all this and more, our Dr. Robert Murphy, Professor of Infectious Disease at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and Executive Director of the Institute for Global Health. And Dr. Maximo Brito, an Infectious Disease Specialist and Professor at UI Health. Welcome uh, both of you to Chicago tonight. Uh, Dr. Brito, first of all, uh, we're nearing a grim uh, landmark here. Two years into the pandemic, one year into vaccines uh, first being introduced, 50 million confirmed cases in the U.S. and 800,000 deaths. Your reflections on, on how we've gotten here after two years. 
Well, it, you know, it's it's unfortunate that we've gotten here, especially over the past six months when we, or, or over the past year that we've had vaccines available to the public. I mean, certainly amongst those people who, 800,000 people who died, there are many that were uh, deaths that were preventable by vaccine and unfortunately uh, didn't happen uh, the way, uh, you know, we, we wanted it to be. But it's important to look forward and know that we have important tools to fight the pandemic and continue to do whatever we can to get as many people vaccinated, this time with the booster. Uh, but whoever hasn't gotten the vaccine, they need to start the series as soon as possible, especially in the setting of Omicron. And Dr. Murphy, that vaccine was widely available around the second or third quarter of the year, and yet to deaths this year have outpaced last year. What went wrong? Well, the problem is the unvaccinated people are really driving this uh, pandemic. And if you look in the hospital, you can look at the University of Illinois, you can look at uh, uh, Northwestern, it's predominantly full of people who are unvaccinated. Once you get sick with COVID and you end up in the hospital, it's too late for the vaccine. And that's what's imploding the health system, uh, not only here, but actually it's worse in other places like in Michigan. I mean, it, it is really a crisis there. And this is gonna continue uh, until we get the vaccination rate well over 90%. Especially with these colder indoor months uh, just beginning. Dr. Murphy, I'll stick with you. Okay, Omicron, what do we know now from preliminary data? It is infectious, it does cause a less severe disease, but the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine uh, are not exactly foolproof in, in blocking this variant. Yeah, well, here's the facts. Last week, 0.4% of all the COVID in the United States was, was Omicron. As of today, that's up to 2.9%. That's a seven-fold increase in one week. That means that we have a doubling approximately every two days. This is way more than Delta. Uh, and then you've got New York, New Jersey, uh, and Puerto Rico uh, that are now up to 13%. Uh, is Omicron. So this thing is going to take over probably this month uh, at the latest uh, in January, and we're going to see Omicron take off. The good news, you already mentioned, it may be a little bit milder disease, and the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines appear to work, but actually you have to have the booster. You've got to have the first two, like uh, Max has said, and you need the third one to really get the 70% protection. And of all the people who've been vaccinated, only a quarter of them have had the three shots. So we've got to work on the boosters and we've got to get these unvaccinated people. We have to offer them the vaccination. A campaign for boosters uh, will have to be up and running. And Dr. Brito, uh, officials have announced uh, the detection of Omicron in Cook County, in Illinois. Uh, from, from your vantage, what does that portend for the weeks and the months ahead here? Increasing in the number of cases. We were expecting uh, the first cases to be coming to Illinois, uh, as with uh, for uh, another 36 uh, states. And as Dr. Murphy says, we're fully expecting that Omicron sometime in the next month will take over Delta as the predominant variant uh, in the US. So I'm not surprised that we have our first of cases and there are more to come, um, we expect uh, that, you know, Omicron will be the predominant variant in the state of Illinois pretty soon and in the country. And that's, uh, I'm going to sign there. And let's uh, listen to what Dr. Fauci has said about booster shots uh, at a White House briefing. Take a look. There's no doubt that we can say that optimal protection when you're dealing with an mRNA is with three doses. There's no doubt about that, both for the durability of the infect of the protection as well as the protection against the Omicron variant. So there's little doubt about that among those of us who work in this field. Uh, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Fauci is saying there is no variant of booster shot needed, but a booster in general. What, what do you make of the statements? Well, you know, Dr. Fauci's uh, Vaccine Research Center uh, at the NIH uh, did a lot of the early work with the Moderna and the mRNA vaccine. Uh, he's very intimately involved uh, in the development of that. And plus, he's our leading uh, expert uh, in the country, and he's, he's aware of how good these vaccines work. 
He's not ready to pull the trigger yet to redesign a new vaccine, which is going to take at a minimum three months, probably five, to retool it. And with all this virus replicating, it, Omicron is just, that's the one today. You know, what is it going to be tomorrow? What is it going to be next month? Uh, it's probably going to change again. So the question is, when do you start retooling these vaccines? What he is saying is we can wait for the next one because you get boosted with this one, you're 70% protected against severe disease. So again, this the, the the booster here from the original mRNA vaccine or any of the vaccines uh, is most effective at this point. Dr. Brito, Pfizer also has a pill. Uh, they're saying it's almost 90% effective uh, and strong against this variant. Um, once this pill is approved, uh, will that offer an extra layer of protection? It is a welcome tool in the fight against the disease. Um, it decreases hospitalization and severe disease. Um, so it would be a good strategy for someone who has a breakthrough infection or for someone who is unvaccinated. However, I should caution the public that th this is not a substitute for the vaccine. This is an additional tool in the fight against the pandemic. We still have the best tool available is the vaccine. Safe, effective, and in and, and, and the best tool that we have so far. So it shouldn't be a substitute. It's a welcome addition. And we have a few seconds left, uh, Dr. Murphy, the upcoming Christmas holiday. Uh, could this be dangerous if, if lots of folks are gathering in big numbers? Uh, you can do it, but you have to do it safely. So how do you do it safely? Number one, you keep the numbers down. You keep uh, stay away from dense indoor crowds. And if you're having a party at your house or dinner, whatever, everybody has to be vaccinated. Uh, if they can, if they're eligible for a booster, get a booster today because uh, it'll probably be mostly effective uh, by the time uh, Christmas comes around or just the holiday season. So don't mix unvaccinated and vaccinated people. That is just a recipe for disaster. And just right. use common sense and uh, keep the numbers down. Important words to live by. And our thanks to Dr. Maximo Brito and Dr. Murphy. Thanks so much. Thanks for Thank having me. Good evening. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Thank you, Paris. The people who lived in the former Cabrini Green public housing complex once called it home, despite its reputation for being a violent, poverty-stricken community. And when the city started its demolition in the mid-90s, it was also the only black neighborhood on Chicago's north side. Now, a year-long Better Government Association investigation details the city's failure to keep promises of jobs and housing for current and former Cabrini Green residents. Joining us to discuss her findings is Alejandra Cancino, BGA reporter behind this investigation. Alejandra, welcome back. So what prompted this investigation for you? Well, um, you know, in, in the wake of um, the George Floyd murder and the, the protests for um, racial uh, justice uh, across the city and the nation, really, we began to think about um, uh, residents in Chicago and why Chicago was so segregated. And inevitably, that led me to public housing and it led me to Cabrini Green, which was one of the only public housing uh, communities in the north side of the city. Right. And, and obviously a lot of the segregation that we see that continues today, of course, uh, is reflective of that. Uh, so the Daly administration promised thousands of families they'd have the right to return. But you found that only 20 percent ever did return. Uh, what happened? Well, it's, a, it's been a long time, right? Like the promise was made um, 25 years ago. Um, in the meantime, uh, the towers just slowly came down. There were once 23 towers in uh, the Cabrini Green area. Um, all of them were demolished by 2011. And along the way, families, families were forced out of the neighborhood. Um, it's been so long and the city has taken so long to actually build back the communities. There is a number of empty parcels where buildings used to be there before um, that some people have moved on. Some people chose to relocate in other public housing communities. Some people's received a, a um, Section 8 voucher um, sort of a housing subsidy. Um, others, uh, hundreds of them are missing. The CHA can't find them, even though it has uh, placed ads in newspapers and it had higher, it has hired companies to find them. It just can't, can't find them. Um, some of them have died waiting. 
which, which is unfortunate. Now, we know um, about 146 row home units, row house units, are still occupied uh, by people from Cabrini Green. Did you notice um, any, you know, desire or sense of hope to return for those residents who had the right to return that you spoke with? Absolutely. So one of the residents that I spoke with, um, Ms. Russell, she um, had uh, been waiting to come. She lived in one of the Cabrini ha um, housing high rises um, and left in 1993. Um, she was one of the families that were dis displaced and forced to move out before even one of the buildings was torn down. The first one was torn down in 1995. Um, she was offered to go into another public housing community and she decided that she didn't feel safe in that community and ended up going into the uh, private market ended up in logan square her parents helped her help support her for many years when they died she struggled to be able to be uh, a mother and work at the same time she ended up essentially homeless uh, for many years living in, in other people's homes and really trying to come back for the last 10 years she has been calling in to see if she could come back to Cabrini Green. And they couldn't find her name on the lists that the CHA created um, of people who had this right to return. And so the answer was no, until earlier this year, someone thought to actually check her social security number and there she was, they found her and she was able to move back this year. Wow. Um, Cabrini Green residents, they were also promised some 2,500 construction jobs, but in your research, you found that there were only 40 for those residents. Tell us what you found there. Yeah, and this was a really important part of the promise for me to find because, you know, there is the promise of housing and the, the promise of being able to come back, which is really important. And, and reporters, numerous reporters before me have also tallied, we sort of updated it to today's numbers. Um, but the promise of economic opportunities, right? Like the city has spent to uh, or will spend by the time it's all over two billion dollars re, uh, redeveloping redeveloping this community um and here it was a promise of creating 2500 jobs what happened to them right we could only find 40. we uh ended up um getting records from the 1990s of a center that the daily administration put in cabrini green to match residents with jobs and what we found was that many of the jobs that were created were not construction jobs, were lower paying jobs in the service industry. Um, and we also received uh, data from the CHA, which essentially showed the same thing. The, the jobs that are being created are not the uh, high paying construction jobs that the Dell administration promised. And to be clear, Alejandra, at the time, you know, the community, like the community leaders, they did voice opposition to this demolition and argued instead for uh, for the high rises to be uh, repaired and renovated versus uh, being demolished altogether. Um, and but you reported, you know, to that end that for years before demolition, Cabrini Green had been neglected by their landlord, which is the Chicago Housing Authority. Uh, what are you hearing from CHA and the Lightfoot administration today? You know, we spend months really trying, reaching out to um, the uh, a spokesperson of the um, Chicago Housing Authority CEO, Tracy Scott, and uh, asked numerous times to meet with her and show her our findings. And um, we did the same with the um, uh, Lori Lightfoot administration, with the housing commissioner, uh, Marisa Novara, um, with Alderman, um, Alderman Burnett, who is the alderman of the area, and all of them declined um, the interview request. Okay. Um, Alejandra Cancino, Better Government Association, thank you so much for joining us. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Up next, a photographer documents the American dream. We'll explain right after this. I come from a people that not only found a way to survive through the most horrific circumstances, but they thrived. I could not save one of the boys of color in my own life. If my family could be exposed to this horror, then really it could happen to anyone. We are truly all in this together. And there's much more ahead on the program, including our Spotlight Politics team with more details on today's city council meeting. But first, many immigrants dream of owning and operating a small business. 
A Chicago-based photographer has a personal understanding of immigration, and he has spent years documenting small businesses. He calls his project immigrant-owned, and it's about to be expanded in a big way. Producer Mark Vitale has this story. In Pilsen, a photographer revisits a bakery he knows well. Immigrant-owned businesses are like as American as it gets. Largely the people doing this kind of work and, and still taking a risk and opening up a small business, you know, are immigrants. It's people that are new to the country and it is very much that American dream, which for many people is alive and well, and, and, but at the same time it's still got that very risky element, you know. Many businesses I've been to and photographed, I went back later and they're not there, they're closed. He makes portraits of the people and the places. This table gets a lot of use, man. I'll go into a store that catches my eye and I'll go in and I'll look around and introduce myself and tell them a little bit about my project and, you know, ask a little bit about, you know, the history of their business. It's almost like being invited into someone's home, depending on the way people decorate their shops and, and, and the way family exists in those spaces. If we lose that, it's all going to be Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks and it's just going to suck, you know. <laughs> Jonathan Castillo's other projects have included documenting car culture in Southern California and an early effort photographing the action at a paintball course that he managed in his native Los Angeles. Now an adjunct professor at Columbia College, Castillo had modest beginnings. My grandmother definitely had some stories. You know, she came into the country undocumented and, you know, was deported several times and kept coming back and basically was really determined to just have her life here. My dad had a small business, so while he isn't technically an immigrant himself, you know, he's the child of immigrants, and uh, he had a little computer store when I was growing up, so I used to spend a lot of time in my dad's storefront. And, uh, you know, I'd get off of school, come over there, hang out in the shop, you know, till late at night, do my homework there. So I do have a certain kind of affinity for these kinds of spaces, just growing up in one. Castillo's work will be on view in large format at O'Hare Airport when the Terminal 5 expansion is completed. He is now in the fifth year of this ongoing series. Overall, I think the project is a celebration of the contribution of immigrants to the city as a whole and to the fabric of the many unique different communities we have, the different neighborhoods we have in the city. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. Highlights of Jonathan Casillo's photography project, Immigrant Owned, will be unveiled at O'Hare later in the new year. You can see more of his photography on our website. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, the city is now handing out test strips for the potent opioid fentanyl, how that might reduce overdoses. You're taking away your right to decide what happens in your ward tomorrow. In your ward tomorrow is Aldermanic prerogative dead after city council members vote for a project in Alderman Anthony Napolitano's ward over his objections? That might not be of your we use art as a mechanism to cut through the noise. And how a community campaign in Inglewood is encouraging folks to get the COVID-19 vaccine. But first, some more of today's top stories. The Chicago Board of Education settles years-long federal lawsuits with the Chicago Teachers Union that argued layoffs disproportionately affected black teachers and paraprofessionals. Earlier today, the board okayed a $9.25 million settlement with the CTU, which will go toward a fund to benefit 400-plus staff members who were let go under the district's turnaround policies at schools placed on probation between 2012 and 2014. CPS said earlier this week that resolving the matter was in the best interest of the students. And it may be hard to believe, but today is the one-year anniversary of the first COVID-19 vaccinations in Illinois. Dr. Maria, Marina Del Rios from the University of Illinois Health System was the first of five frontline healthcare workers to receive the, Fi the Pfizer vaccine in Chicago. Illinois public health officials say that since then, more than 18 million doses have been administered across the state. President Joe Biden visits tornado-ravaged communities in Kentucky. Speaking in Dawson Springs, where at least 13 people died on Friday night, Biden pledged the federal government would do all it can to help stricken communities recover. Back in the 1900s, Dawson Springs uh, was uh, a place where people came to be healed because of the mineral waters. Literally, it was a place you came to heal. Now it's our turn to help the entire town to heal. At least 88 people were killed in Friday night's storms across six states, including six people who died after an Amazon warehouse collapsed in Illinois. 
but the highest death toll, death toll by far was in Kentucky, where 74 people died and more than 100 remain unaccounted for. And finally, if you think 60 degree days in December are unusual, you would be right. The National Weather Service says today's high of 65 degrees in Chicago breaks the previous record for December 15th by one degree that was set 50 years ago back in 1971. And now Paris, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. A new effort is underway to help reduce the number of overdoses in Chicago by distributing fentanyl test strips. Now, 87% of fatal overdoses in Cook County this year are related to fentanyl, which is a highly addictive synthetic opioid. The city's public health department is distributing these test strips to try and reduce the number of deaths from the drug. And joining us now with more are Dr. Wilnies Jasmine, Medical Director of Behavioral Health with the Chicago Department of Public Health, and Jeff Thett McDaniel, HIV tester and Narcan specialist with the Chicago Recovery Alliance. Thank you both for being here. Uh, first, Dr. Jasmine, what prompted the city to start using these fentanyl test strips? Yeah, to add a little bit more context to it, um, as a result of the reports that were released, um, that showed that there were increased number of opioid overdose deaths during 2020. Um, the CDC, by the CDC, um, they also announced that federal funding, um, mainly the grants they send out to the different jurisdictions, can also be used to purchase fentanyl test strips. And so um, as a health department, we decided to move ahead to purchase them because they're an effective evidence-based harm reduction tool. And, and how many has the city, city distributed so far and how do they work? Yeah, so, so far, um, since the end of October, we've been able to distribute about um, 14 to 1500 kits. And the way they work is um, they only require a small amount of the substance that's about to be used um, to be dissolved in a liquid. Um, so we provide um, sterile water, the actual small container. So we're actually using small ketchup cups um, a stir, something to stir it with, and then you place the strip in to test the substance and you wait about one or two minutes for a result. And, and Jeff, how crucial have these test strips been uh, from, from what you've seen on the ground? Well, from the ground, working out there with individuals, they have been a life changer. Um, at my site today, I saw 42 people, and out of the 42 people, 38 people knew what fentanyl test strips was and that they wanted it. Um, it's just, it's, it's giving them that freedom to use the drugs comfortably and safely, to know that they're able to test their drugs and have the options to know if it's fentanyl on there, that they know they can use the drugs, use less of the drugs, or use the drugs with Narcan as well. So it's been it very crucial. We're talking about opioids. Uh, there's been, for years and years and years, a rash of heroin laced with fentanyl. Jeff, that, what about the argument that uh, the city and groups should be discouraging any kind of opioid use, uh, and this might be encouraging the use, even though it's encouraging a safer use by testing whether there's fentanyl in there? I'm going to say this, sir. This problem is not going to go away. You know what I mean? It's not going to go away. So do we want more death toll numbers to continue to rise? Or do we want to give people fit now to test their drugs and, and be able to use their drugs safely and controllably? I say those who people who oppose to it, you have to look at the broad picture. If we don't, our death toll numbers are going to keep rising with this overdose. You know, we already close to 600 overdose already. And fentanyl has contributed to 82% of that already with the overdose. So these test trips with the Narcan are, are, are life changer. They're changing the whole game in the overdose. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. I applaud the CDC. Right, okay, let's talk about the overdose, the overdose deaths. As we mentioned in 2020, there were 1,844, a slight dip in 2021, 1,383, although still some pending cases. Uh, Dr. Jasmine, is this a measurable drop this year and a positive sign overall? Um, anytime we see a decrease in number of deaths, um, we always see it as a positive sign. And so, um, the whole concept of harm reduction is to remove barriers um, that are in place that can lead to death. So anytime we can save a life, um, either through um, making sure people have the tools they need to test the drug before they use it, or to have the um, drug reversal medication, Narcan, available, 
um, we consider that a win. But in addition, um, by giving the fentanyl test kits away, um, we're hoping to start this conversation, um, not only with the harm reduction um, outreach organizations, but also in substance use services and um, healthcare providers that they are also um, screening individuals specifically for fentanyl. And, and, and as we mentioned, uh, the vast majority of, of opioid deaths come as a result of fentanyl. Why is that, Dr. Jasmine? Why such an overwhelming amount of deaths due to fentanyl? Is there more fentanyl in opioids this year over years past? Since we began tracking um, the components of the drugs that are found in the systems from people who experience overdose deaths, um, we have been seeing an increasing amount of fentanyl present. And so some of those reasons um, could be, uh, is multifactorial. So some of it could be related to the pandemic um, due to the border closures. So that might have made it more difficult for the drugs to actually come into the, to the country. And so fentanyl is very cheap and easy to make. So, um, and so it made it easier to transport or um, there may have been additional labs that were actually started um, within the U.S. to manufacture the fentanyl. A lot, a lot of dealers cut a lot of these drugs with fentanyl. Jeff, that what else can city officials do to reduce the number of overdose deaths in Chicago and Cook County and across the region? Partner with other organizations. You know, let's get the word out there. Let's get these fentanyl test strips out there. Let's get this Narcan out there. Let's remove the stigma behind all of it and let people know that it's okay. You're not alone. You're not alone. There's organizations out here that will work with you at any level that you at to help you better yourself. And certainly uh, overdose, uh, the other uh, epidemic going on alongside COVID-19. Our thanks to Jeff Thett McDaniel and Dr. Wilnies Jasmine. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. And up next, more on a busy city council meeting today in Spotlight Politics. But first, we take a look at the weather. rough day in city council. The Thompson Center is closer to being sold and so much more in our spotlight politics. Joining us again, Amanda Vinicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. Welcome back, everybody. So, Heather, um, let's start, please, with uh, Carrie Austin collapsing during the city council meeting. What happened and what's the latest? Well, we wish I wish I knew I could give people an update on her condition. We just don't know. Um, she's slumped over, and this comes after a host of medical problems that Carrie Austin has suffered. Um, she's 72 years old. She has been indicted for lying to the FBI and for taking bribes. She is actually due back in court telephonically on Friday. In the last hearing, her attorney told the judge presiding over the case that she was suffering very seriously illnesses of a cardiac nature and that's really all we know it was a frightening moment but as we heard the mayor say it was you know uh, somewhat heartwarming to see alderman sort of rush to her and to make sure that she was okay and i know many people were glad that alderman anthony napolitano was there of course he's a former firefighter and he is trained to handle emergencies like that that's right and also as you've reported earlier we know that she was conscious um, and right. it sounds like she, she asked not to be taken to the hospital. So, uh, of course, wishing good health there. And we know that some of the stuff that she's dealing with could be uh, potential contributing factors. None of us is a doctor. Um, older people, though, they also approve sports betting at Chicago's professional sports arenas. So, Paris, what does this mean? Betting, you know, betting windows are going to come to Bulls, Hawks, Bears, all those locations? Seems like it. I mean, it means a pretty lucrative revenue stream for all of Chicago's major professional sports franchises. It's pretty rare, rare when you get most of the big-time owners, Ricketts and Reinsdorf and Wirtz, coming to city council, lobbying for something like an older person. It's hard to ignore. Of course, it was controversial because Neil Bloom, who is the owner of Rush Street Gaming, which owns Rivers Casino and has two bids out for the Chicago Casino, said, don't approve this. It's going to cannibalize 
future potential revenues at a Chicago casino. Some suspected maybe he was afraid it might take some business away from his existing Rivers Casino and Displains. But then the city had a study that it commissioned that came out and said, no, these are different clientele here. It's a different person that's going to walk in to this new, what they're going to call the Draft King Sportsbook at Wrigley Field. Uh, and bet on whether the ball is going to dribble onto the mound in between innings versus <laughs> some go to the casino and bet at the sports book there. So a uh, little disagreement on whether or not it would have a big impact uh, on casinos. And Ricketts has said that now that this is approved, he's ready to start building this thing in the corner of Sheffield and Addison and, and get it up and running in 2023. Okay. So yeah, I'll just jump ahead, in real Eric. quick and say that tomorrow we're going to get our first look at these five casino, casino proposals uh, starting at one o'clock. It will be all five proposals will be presented at a public hearing and it will really give us, I think, the first chance to see exactly what's being proposed, where and sort of what the city stands to gain from that. And these are all crucial questions because the city is counting on revenue from a casino to shore up its police and fire pensions this that's where this money is going to go from a casino okay so alder people approved a nearly three million dollar settlement with anjanette young for that botched police raid of the social workers home here's what mayor Lori lightfoot had to say about that today we recognize what miss young went through and the trauma that she experienced and i think the proof is in a pudding unanimously which rarely happens on matters of, of settlements the city council affirmed the agreement that had been reached with Ms. Young and her council to pay her $2.9 million. You know, Heather, the mayor's former corporation council slammed the settlement, but he was fired. So how does this stack up with other settlements from City Hall? Well, it really ranks right up there. So um, by comparison, the family of Laquan McDonald, who of course was shot and murdered by former police officer Jason Van Dyke, his family got $5 million. And so it, it is in the same sort of um, ballpark, but it wasn't the only huge settlement on today's agenda. The city agreed to pay $1.2 million to the family of a 14 year old teen who was, uh, was shot in the back by a police officer and then kicked in the head while he lay dying. This was after a foot chase back in 2014, and it will not be the last uh, foot chase police misconduct lawsuit that we will see. Of course, um, we are all still reporting on the death of 13-year-old Adam Toledo back in March, who was shot and killed after a foot chase. Hey, Brandis, can I pick up on something you mentioned about the former Corporation Council, Mark Fleshner, who not only said that, he had some very heated comments for his former boss, the mayor, calling her rude, petulant, a quote, disaster, uh, just uh, ripping her to shreds. Now, this is intriguing because not only did they work together, but he's been an ally of Lori Lightfoot's for years and years and years. They've been friends going back years and years. Clearly a major breakup here, and uh, obviously he's unhappy with how he lost his job, but um, saying things like she's she's been a complete disaster and uh, um, just kind of kind of remarkable comments there. Ouch, yeah, those are harsh words from someone who used to, uh, apparently used to be friends with. Amanda, um, as Heather just mentioned, there were other settlements approved that totaled $2.2 million uh, to settle misconduct in foot chases. Does the city budget for these estimated settlements? Yeah, the, the city does budget, not precisely for, obviously there's no predicting what situation, but yeah, they, they, they do budget money for settlements. I believe there's been reporting um, uh, from another outlet, I want to say ABC, that found $67 million so far this year in police misconduct. So yes, this is something that cities, it's not just Chicago, all cities do this. These are very tense situations oftentimes and of course unless there there's this been a lot of debate over qualified immunity typically if you, you have a police officer not personally legally liable for any sort of situation it is on an officer's employer so often again a municipality to take that up if there is any sort of misconduct or wrongdoing i i don't foresee even though again illinois has a very big criminal justice overhaul that is slow Slowly taking place. There is no dismantling of qualified immunity as part of that, and I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. In fact, Anjanette Young's uh, attorney still says what she wants, of course, is never to have had this situation happen to her, but also for the city to act and do things like 
making sure that police wait before entering a home, even in a situation like this, banning any sort of, you know, pointing of guns at children. She wants more action taken beyond just a cash out, but materially that she believes will going forward spare others from being in a situation such as the one she was in. And so Anthony Napolitano's aldermanic prerogative uh, overruled as older people uh, backed uh, a mayor backed apartment development, Heather. Uh, how rare is it that aldermanic prerogative is ignored? It is basically unprecedented, especially in such a high profile case like this. And uh, it was really fascinating to hear Mayor Lori Lightfoot say, yep, we're all a little bit uncomfortable doing this, but we're doing this basically for two reasons. One, we need to provide affordable housing near O'Hare. This building will be built along the CTA blue line, just two stations down from O'Hare. And two, that this is an attempt, she said, quote, to break the grip of segregation end quote in Chicago and those are very high stakes because of course she was elected on promises to I, I do exactly that and there can be really no argument that aldermen who represent white wealthy wards in Chicago have used this power to prevent affordable housing from being built in their wards and this is really a refutation of that ability and we will have to see whether this is just a one-time thing or whether this really changes how the city approaches affordable housing. All right, real quick, you know, Paris to that end, is this a slippery slope because Napolitano was warning his colleagues that it could happen to them too? Well, like Heather said, it's, it's unprecedented. It could be a slippery slope on issues of affordable housing for the reasons Heather mentioned that the mayor wants to, to help reduce segregation in the city. I would think that it won't be a slippery slope on other issues. Right now in a pandemic, it's hard to vote against affordable housing when people are still struggling and and this is what the mayor promised when she ran she said we're going to get rid of aldermanic prerogative we can't it's ripe with the uh, potential for corruption and pay to play and uh but aldermen say but who knows their wards better than older people so there's arguments on both sides of this but this is something that the mayor campaigned on doing one of the principal things she campaigned on doing yeah, so moving over to state politics, state is one step closer to selling the uh, James R. Thompson Center for about $70 million. Amanda, who is this buyer and what do they plan to do with the building? Prime Group is the buyer and they plan to actually keep a lot of it intact. There's going to be some sort of glass curtain that will help, they say, to prevent some of the issues that you have right now with all of the noise that comes from a fast food court and the CTA and it being really a public building rising up and as people, many of whom are state employees, of course, are trying to go about their work day and be on calls. Um, I know a lot of people who work there. Let me tell you, I, there is a lot of excitement for at least something to be done. There are all sorts of images you can see of, you know, um, water dripping every time it rains. Uh, today, it was evidently very, very hot in there because, of course, that unseasonal warm weather. I will say what is interesting is the state getting, I believe, $70 million is what Prime Group is paying for this, although Illinois eventually going to, in fact, pay some back because they're going to lease back the office space. This, of course, does keep the building intact, and I'm not privy to all of the agreement, but at a time when uh, current Governor J.B. Pritzker's predecessor, Bruce Rauner, had been looking at selling the building, he was aiming to get upwards of 200 to $300 million to sell this prime piece of property right in the loop. So Illinois getting it off its hands, a lot of deferred maintenance, they no longer, the state need, no longer needs to take care of. But certainly it is a different real estate world than had this occurred years prior. Of course. Meanwhile, uh, Governor Prisker downplaying a rumor that he had presidential aspirations. Uh, Amanda, he laughed it off, but where'd this rumor come from? He did laugh it off, but it came from the New York Times, and generally this is, you know, I try and uh, give respect to fellow journalists who've done their homework, and certainly uh, I, I think it is not outside the realm of possibility for Pritzker to be mentioned, in part because he is a governor of a very big state, and also he's got a whole lot of connections with Democrats before he became Illinois' governor. He funded many a campaign. He has the dollars to do something like this and to get that going, but 
He's very much focused, he says, on the next gubernatorial race, and this is sort of putting the the donkey before the cart, if you will, when it comes to Democratic politics. It was a, a mention that caused a flurry of activity, but in Illinois, um, I'm going to say I, for one, am more focused, as I am quite sure the Pritzker camp is as well, uh, on the 22 election. But said, I'm sure anytime somebody says, hey, you'd be good for president, and there are folks with White House connections, that has to feel good, right? <laughs> Um, so meanwhile, Cook County Democrats officially endorsed candidates Alexi Giannullius and Fritz Kagey. Heather, any surprise with these endorsements? You know, a, a little bit. Um, so Alexi Giannullius, of course, ran for Senate unsuccessfully. He did serve in statewide office, so he does have a track record of being able to win statewide. However, it's a hotly contested primary. He faces city clerk Ana Valencia uh, and two older people, Pat Dowell and David Moore. And I think that there were a number of, of Democratic Party members who voted not to endorse in that race, and his endorsement come, came just with a slight majority of people. So that race, I think, is very much up for grabs. In the Cook County assessor race, Fritz Kagey uh, was elected four years ago, promising to revise the way the state or the county um, assesses properties in terms of taxes. He has made a lot of people unhappy because he has said that the system was unfair. And if you change the system, that means somebody's got to pay more. Uh, he is facing um, Carrie Steele, who is a current member of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, and her husband, Mays Jackson, a well-known radio um, personality, says he will run against Tony Preckwinkle for Cook County Board President. He is so angry that his wife did not get the nod. So we will have to watch all of that. But um, th these these elections are right around the river bend, and uh, we uh, are, are going to have time. Going to be another fun election year for Spotlight Politics. Real quick, yeah. Harris, before we let you all go, uh, Illinois' pot czar, Toy Hutchinson, leaving public life to head up a cannabis lobbying group. Is that a quick turnaround? Is not is there not there some limit on uh, when you can go lobby after leaving public office? Well, it's when, when you're leaving uh, being an elected official as a lawmaker. She was an elected official, a state senator, then the governor brought her in to be sort of this deputy governor role or top advisor role who was in charge of the cannabis program. So she isn't really privy to those rules, but another instance of, of a revolving door and she was very instrumental uh, in, in crafting Illinois' uh, cannabis regulations, and now she's going to see a, a lucrative career in that industry. We see this happen all the time, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, where you know legislators leverage their knowledge on certain things to go get jobs in those industries that they were that they were making laws on. So, uh, but no, she she wouldn't, uh, as far as I understand, be subject to any of the revolving door provisions, which are really weak to begin with in Illinois. Okay, another discussion for another Spotlight Politics some other time. Heather Sharon, Amanda Venicky, and Paris Schutz. Thanks, guys. Up next, using art to promote public health. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but in this case, some community members have a picture, hope a picture will save a life. Arts correspondent Angel Edo recently took us to Englewood, where a mural is working to bring awareness to the COVID-19 vaccine. Here's another look. On 63rd and Halstead, an Englewood family stands with an important message that reads, protect yourself and the people you love. Commissioned by Amplifier, a nonprofit committed to highlighting community issues through art and media, Chicago artist Brandon Bro created a digital mural that was printed and hung to promote vaccine awareness. Now, Bro says in a media driven world where there is a lot of false information, he wanted to use his art to educate. We use art as a mechanism to cut through the noise, and you know, art has a history, very good track record of being able to do so. Uh, so we beautify our communities, we create this work in the, in the hopes that it leaves people informed and uplifts them at the same time. This uplifting image displays the Evans family, Father Dale, Mother Charlie, and their 18-year-old son, John. They're founders of the new generation, Harvest Church. We are here to try to help in that aspect and say, listen, we might not know each other by name, but we can feel each other's pain. We go through something, we go through the same thing. 
They hope their advocacy will not only stretch beyond the homes of their neighbors, but within their family as well. Like with their eldest son, who wasn't featured in the mural. Our grandchildren are vaccinated. Everybody is vaccinated. Yeah. My son is not vaccinated. I hope he sees this. While this physical mural might be temporary, Bro says he hopes that the message behind it lives forever. We have the responsibility to put our best foot forward and uh, showing up and uh, having that story so that the future can have an example of what this looks like. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Edo. Again, that mural stands at the corner of 63rd and Halstead. It features a QR code which will direct folks to Facebook's COVID Information Center as the company is also a sponsor of the project. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can also get the show via Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Landmarks and community favorites in historic Grand Boulevard as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. And a Chicago thespian makes her Broadway debut in Pretty Woman the Musical. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you all so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm which is proud to honor founder and senior partner Robert A. Clifford and partner Shannon McNulty for their award for excellence in pro bono and public interest service. <laughs>